Um, so thank you everyone for, for still being here for this final presentation of the workshop today. It's going to be incredibly hard to follow Chelsea and Steve, but I will give it a go. Uh, so today I am, well, those of you who know me already will know that I'm obsessed with talking about robots all the time. Do not know how to build them, but uh, they are my favourite thing to talk about and to research. So this presentation is all about the various ways that I have tried to research robots without actually having said robot to do research on until about last week. We're very excited. We finally got one. Okay, so let me just quit that and get that going. Okay, so uh, my field of research is in social robots and artificial intelligence. So I won't bore you by reading through the various definitions up there, but uh, you will have seen social robots in the past, for example, the cute little pepper robots and the now robots that are even smaller. Um, and artificial intelligence is all around us all the time, which is both a, a great thought and a scary thought. So things like Siri and Alexa and Hey Google, um, our smart home technologies that we were just talking about at my table as part of the last activity. Um, and even something as simple as the um, autocorrect in your phone when you're typing a text message and it's like, oh, didn't you mean, hope you're having a good day so fat? I'm like, no, no, I did not. I'm definitely not sending that to my mom. Um, so it's literally all around us all the time and it's growing. And that's, as I said, exciting, but also kind of terrifying because we have this technology all around us and it's accelerating and we don't fully understand it yet. So something else that can add a lot of complexities is the fact that a lot of this technology, if we are designed, if it is designed for us to be able to see it and interact with it, tends to be um, humanized. So when we humanize something, we are anthropomorphizing it, we're trying to trigger a sense of anthropomorphism. And that is when we are attributing human characteristics to a non-human agent. So this can be in a variety of ways. We can see the, the humanized robots standing over there. Um, it can also be as simple as adding a human-like voice or personality to an artificial intelligence. Uh, so you'll notice that you, know, you often get kind of smart replies from Alexa or Siri or Hey Google, and that's part of anthropomorphizing it and making it more human. Also humans, we are interesting creatures ourselves and we like things more, the more biased they are. So we will actually like a robot more if it seems like it's flawed and not quite perfect. Even if it looks a little bit bored while we're talking to it, we like that robot better than the shiny perfect robot. Humans, what can I say? Uh, so we're seeing this a lot at the moment in unfamiliar environments. Anyone old enough in this room to remember the Microsoft Paperclip? A couple of people? Yeah, I'm just hoping here that I'm not the only one. Uh, so the Microsoft Paperclip was to get us used to that kind of word processing office environment. And then we had the coming of the smartphone and we saw things like Apple Siri. And then as we're going into further unfamiliar environments, as we're trying to get through the pandemic and we're coming up with all of these new technologies to try and help us do that, we are seeing more and more you know, chatbots and personal robots and robots to help us maintain social distancing and all sorts of things. And anthropomorphizing something has a lot of benefits. This is all of the, uh, the kind of research behind it. When we anthropomorphize something, we feel more connected to it and more protective of it. So there was a famous case of a robot in the United States that was um, hitchhiking, um, called the Hitchbot, and making its merry way around the United States, kind of you know putting its thumb up and so on. And um, needless to say, it was um, murdered at some point on its journey. Shouldn't really use the word murder because it is in fact an inanimate object. But people were outraged because they had anthropomorphized this robot, they were really protective of it, and they felt like a friend had been, uh, had been assaulted or had been hurt in this attack. It also makes us less willing to replace those items, which for those of us who are coming here from marketing is both a good and bad thing. It can influence our behavioral preferences, so we start to act like the personality of the things we've anthropomorphized. So if you, um, there was a, a study where they were looking at, I think it was a healthy brand and an unhealthy brand of food, and they were getting people to anthropomorphize the brands and afterwards asking them how willing they'd be to walk up the stairs. And those who had anthropomorphized the unhealthy brand did not want to walk up the stairs. And those who had anthropomorphized the healthy brand did want to walk up the stairs. So very simple, but if you think through the implications of that, 
if we humanize something and we give it a personality, we will start to act in a way that correlates with that personality. That can have some scary outcomes. It also means that we trust these um, agents more and that we tend to attribute more brand personality and brand liking. Uh, a common thing that people tend to anthropomorphize is their cars. Um, a lot of people will name their cars or gender their cars. And research even shows that cars that have been anthropomorphized tend to break down less which would make no sense whatsoever. The only explanation I can think of is that people who get their cars a name care more about their cars and get them serviced more frequently. So you can see how we're adding a bit of complexity here just by humanizing things. And robotics markets are growing faster than we expected. So if you have a look at um, this dotted line across the bottom there, across those columns, that's where we expected the growth to come in at. So we've got military robots coming in where we thought, industrial robots, yeah, commercial, a little bit above. Then we have the consumer robots in that final category, kind of shooting off the charts there. So we have to imagine what these robots would be like so that we can get ready, but imagination certainly has its problems. So this was a, uh, an image that I stole from 1658 of what people used to think crocodiles looked like. Because this was a time where, you know, in the 1600s, there was not a lot of travel. So um, we had to draw exotic paintings. This is from um, medieval art. And uh, we just kind of guessed, or we had some descriptions, or we thought, well, you know, I guess it would have scales. And what do scales look like? Um, I don't know, maybe they look like an armadillo scale because we know what those look like and so on. You can see the result. The same kind of thing happens to us with robots and artificial intelligence. We have to imagine it, so we're kind of imagining something like this. So what I'm going to do is go through a few studies that I've worked on with colleagues in the past and how we've tried to get over that hurdle of how do you research something that people don't have familiarity with yet. So this first study was from a couple of years ago. Now this was um, to do with using um, smart technology inside a household to help manage electricity or energy usage. So our um, task was how might we, um, or how might a household choose to interact with technology to help manage their electricity use, their bills, their appliances, that kind of thing. So that was important because we had this new technology and we also had a different group. So we were used to doing research on how people, individual people use their smartphones or use their TVs or use some other form of technology. What about a household? Who here has ever lived in a household with more than just one person in it? Decision making is different, right? <laughs> it's not just, you know, one person decides and everyone else follows sometimes, but generally it's a bit complicated. Um, so then if we're bringing the technology into this role, what do we see? And we saw after, so our modus operandi here was to do interviews and we'd sit down and say, well, what if, and what would this look like? And could you draw us pictures of? So kind of similar to what we've been doing here today. And what emerged was that people were automatically anthropomorphizing the different technologies based on how much control they were willing to give it. So people would talk about you know, the technology being really passive and just doing what I tell it to do, which would be the intern. And then we had, and they actually gave these two names out. We, we added the intern during analysis, but assistant and manager were mentioned during the interviews. So the assistant interacts with me, it takes instructions and then it goes and follows my commands. And the manager manages my household without me having to think about it. It's the completely no effort option. I put in my preferences and then I go. The manager turns my appliances on and off. If it finds a better deal on my electricity bill, it just goes ahead and switches me and so on. So these were the, the different roles that we found coming out from just talking to people and getting them to draw things and then also being able to watch the body language in the household. Um, with people saying, oh, I would like it to work like this. And you would see someone else at the table kind of go, hmm. Like for those online, I just made kind of a squinty, screwed up my face look. Um, and then you say, oh, how would you um, do things differently? And in some cases, we found that different family members would need different types of roles. So like the parents might want it to be an intern, uh, but the kids within their own rooms wanted it to be a manager and just look after things for them so they didn't have to think about it. Um, so it needed to be programmed. And that wasn't something that we had thought of, was offering a range of different options. And that came out of the interview. So interviews, option one. 
Uh, this was an experiment looking at how people felt about having cooking robots in their houses. So in this case, we visualized everything up. Um, we went to a professional um, graphic designer to do up these illustrations based on what was currently in development and what was already available. And then started asking questions. You know, what if it was humanized? What if it was mechanical? What if it was gendered? And to find out the answers, we put these images into an experiment. So each person only saw one of these. Um, so we had higher external validity because we had accurate source material through the professional graphic design. Not quite as good as being able to put these in the home and observe. Uh, that was one option. Another option is what I call the someone else's shoes. Um, so this was particularly important because this study was about deviance. So I was um, working with my colleagues, um, Paula Dutson and Dominique Greer who, and um, Kate Daunt, who are all deviance researchers. And if you're going to ask someone about doing the wrong thing, it's usually best to put them in someone else's shoes. So in this case, we would say, you know, this is Sam. How is Sam likely to react when the robot accidentally gives them an extra $20? Are they going to keep it? Are they going to return it? Um, what's Sam going to do? And as you can see, what we found was that if an ATM gives you an extra $20, almost everyone's going to pocket it. If a robot gives you an extra um, $20, you're less likely to pocket it, but you're still much more likely to keep that money than if it was a human who accidentally gave you that $20. So again, this was an experiment, but using the, you know, what do you think someone else would do? Another idea was letting the consumer try the technology through a low or high quality simulation. Um, so this was a study looking at personalization and we literally just gave people an interactive survey and said, if you had a new smartphone with these types of features available, please pick and choose which types of features you would like to see. So um, much lower tech, but a similar idea to Chelsea's allowing people to pick different products off the shelves when going through that simulation. And finally, this is a new idea that we have just tried. I am analyzing the data right now. And this is the first person perspective video. Um, so during the pandemic, there's been a huge growth in people um, accessing connection using sites like YouTube and experiencing kind of role play videos in that scenario. So we tried to do one for research and we were looking to understand robots in an office environment. So how are we gonna feel about interacting with the robot in an office environment? So this was literally me strapping a GoPro to my head and pretending to be a, um, a person in an office and kind of interacting with the robot and um, then playing that video for people through the online survey or online experiment rather. So it does seem to have worked. We've got some initial results coming in right now. We're very excited. But as you can see, these are all ideas for how do we actually um, understand technology and how people feel about it before we've got a physical technology there. And obviously, if we can have a physical technology, that's amazing um, because research has shown that we tend to have different reactions when we're actually exposed to something, which is why rather than just asking people, it's so important to have things like the simulations, um, the apps and so on that Steve and Chelsea were talking about before. So enough about uh, this research. Uh, your turn. This is the interactive component of this particular study. So um, they have proposed that uh, for the Olympics here in Queensland in 2032, we will have air taxis. Um, so this is a bit of an older image. This is from last year's design, but I like this design better, so I've used this image. So the role I'm going to ask you to take is imagine that you have been put on a task force to make sure that the public has a positive perception of these air taxis before they take flight in time for the Olympics. So the question is, how will commuters respond to the use of air taxis as an option for transport? So we're bringing these into the Olympics, but obviously once they're here, um, this is, you know, these kind of giant flying drones are something that we could use to commute and to get around for our own meetings and to get to and from work. How do we feel about that? So everyone who is in the room is, has commuted here today. Um, those who are joining us via the chat, You've probably commuted to wherever you're going, or you're going to commute at some point this week. So how would we feel about these giant air taxis? And how will we know what the answer is without actually having access to said air taxi or any commuter who has ever seen one or ridden one? How are we going to deal with that? So um, we have a Padlet board. Sam, have you put that in the chat? Yep, all done. Great. Um, so there's a Padlet board in the chat. This is more of an individual activity. Um, you can have a chat to the people beside you if you like, 
but it's more about kind of putting up your ideas. You know, would you um, do interviews with people? Would you do a simulation? Would you create an app? Um, would you um, do some kind of first person video perspective if you can get access to something like a taxi? You know, would you have someone mock up images? You know, how would you understand how people are going to feel? And I have got some resource cards. This is kind of me being a bit mean. Uh, but you know what, I'll grab them. For those online, I'm just walking off screen for a second to grab my cards. Because as we know, in the real world, things are not easy. You have different team members, you have different amounts of time, you have different amounts of funding. So what I've done is created these different cards with who might be on your team, how much funding you might have, how much time you might have, and each table gets to pick one uh, of each and then use that to create the scenario. So online people, I'm, I'm just going to shuffle these and pick some for you now. So online people, you have five years worth of time and you have $30,000 and your team is going to be working with the government. So online, government, $30,000, five years to figure out the answer. So I'm going to go around to the tables and get everyone to pick a card. Obviously those ones are not available anymore because they're for the online team. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, so, it's a, it's a bit of a, a mean challenge to everyone, but I also like to think it's, it's somewhat realistic. Um, so we don't always get the, the funding, the time, and the, and the team members that we would need to have. You know, one of the cards that didn't get given out was um, to have a multidisciplinary team. And this is, this is quite a good card to have as well um, because it saved me in the past, you know, working with engineers who can actually uh, program the robots and um, get it to do things so that I can video it was a massive part of the success of that strategy or working with graphic designers and so on along the way. So the cards kind of force us into these spaces that we're often in, um, whether we're in industry, in government, in research, where we don't have the ideal environment and we still have to use our imaginations and come up with a way to solve the problem. So let's see, we've had a few people share from online already. I might ask um, anyone here in person, does anyone want to share your solution? Nobody wants to share. <laughs> it's that time of afternoon. I'm going to pick up this table. Um, so we had a few different ideas. So we had uh, the industry team. We had 12 months and we had a million dollars. So we were pretty lucky in that regard. Um, oh, thank you. Um, so we were thinking of conducting sort of an initial scoping, um, showing different images, um, and then conducting a survey afterwards to see how people responded to those different alternatives. Um, so that could also include mock-ups, uh, videos, prototypes, those sort of things that people can look at and we could survey them afterwards. Um, with that budget, we thought we could also conduct analysis on VR or AR. So if you're able to develop virtual environments and then um, conduct analysis on either brainwave, eye tracking, um, what did you write as well? Uh, yeah, so you could, after those, also have some interviews and co-design. Um, after that, going to university incubators or conducting co-designs and interviews, um, and then moving on to your your customer journey mapping, analyzing the data, and releasing a RFO RFI. Nice. But we again, we had the advantage of time and money, so yes, yeah. <laughs> really ideas at all. So the um, at, with all of the different tables, you know, everyone kind of had random chances to what you ended up with. And uh, this table, I think, got the luckiest cards, having um, what did you guys have? 12 months, a um, million dollars, and a team of um, industry experts to work with. This team over here was in the same boat that I'm usually in when I conduct research for myself, which is no funding, um, just me on the team and two years to work on it. So what did you guys come up with with that? Uh, I guess we used, we wanted to test people's um, thoughts of, of air taxis by giving them an equal number of positive and negative 
attributes of air taxis and with no money you can make some youtube videos on your iphone and you could do lots of really short little snippets um some of the negatives would be like things like bird strike where you've got fans like that and you could do like a little animation where it goes up hits a bird and it's meat and comes out and lots of blood splattering everywhere and then another another negative would be the time that it takes for the civil aviation safety briefing because before it, before anyone goes up in the air you are required to give some sort of a briefing so you know it might be a 20 minute trip you might save five minutes versus the car but then it's a five minute briefing so uh that's a negative but then there's lots of positives because it's like huge drama because uh, it's seeing Brisbane from the sky, it's like better than the city cat. It's like, you know, spot your house from an aeroplane. It's, it's, it's getting there quicker in traffic. Um, so you give people an equal number of positive videos and negative videos, and then um, get them to think of, like get them to respond after having an equal number of positive and negative stimuli. Would you add anything? That's it. Got under. Everyone's happy. Okay, I'll take that. Now, does anyone else want to share in the room online? We're happy, we're comfortable? Okay. So, I'll just switch that one off so I'm not getting feedback. Um, so, thank you all for your creativity and for playing along um, with my very mean card game um, this afternoon. But hopefully, it's kind of given you a bit of a, a look at how you might come up with ways to address, you know, technologies that we haven't seen yet and how you might do that when we're in a constrained environment and we don't have everything that we'd like to have necessarily. So that actually brings us to the end of the session for today. Um, but before we wrap up, I'd like to ask, does anyone have any questions for myself or Chelsea or Steve um, before we go, whether in person or online?